Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. Hey, I didn't get to say this last week because we got snowed out, but Happy New Year. 2024 is here. If you did not get a chance, go to the website, watch last week. We kicked off a brand new series called How to Study Your Bible. And before we get into that today, I just want to let you know that this is not like a technical class on how to outline and underline and what color markers to use and that sort of thing. This is how to understand the Bible. And before you start to even try to get in there and read the Bible, we got to understand what we're reading. What's the context? What's the story behind it? How is it set up? So that's what we're going to do in this series. Last when, or this past Wednesday night, we had a great time in Wednesday night Bible study. We're averaging about 150 people on Wednesday nights for that. Uh, it is still open. You can come check it out, uh, audit the class, that sort of thing. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get the credit for the program because we're already two weeks in. But if anybody wants to come see what it's about, I'll give you a quick outline. We lecture for 45 minutes. We break up into small groups for discussion for about 30 minutes. And then we come back for a 45-minute lecture. And then we do open Q&A to the instructor. And, you know, this past week we got into some debates about some stuff. And so I love that. Like, I come alive. And so those of you that don't like to debate and don't like to try to make your point and that sort of thing, you know, maybe some people feel a little bit awkward with that. But it's good to grow when you think you know something or you've studied something or you've heard something and maybe that's challenged and then you go back into scripture and try to find your truth and try to find the answers. It's healthy, it's good, it's how we grow. We understand this, people grow in two moments, need to know and need to grow moments. Need to know and need to grow. And those are like those moments that get you into the word of God to study it out and figure it out. And we also understand that people grow the most in circles around tables and not so much in rows. So sometimes it's hard in a room like this. I may say something from the pulpit today that you either disagree with or you need more clarity. And you know, it's hard in an assembly like this. You can't really have someone raise their hand and ask that question because it disrupts the flow of what's going on. But Wednesday night Bible study is set up for that if you're interested in doing that. This series is, again, like I said, not focused around the technical side of how to read your Bible or even giving you a reading guide. It's to answer some questions that maybe we get hung up on when reading the Bible. And I found this verse in Nehemiah this morning, Nehemiah 8.18, it said this, Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read the book of the law of God. So every day this guy Ezra was in the scripture reading it. And I just want to give you that tip. Read something in the Bible every day. Or get the Bible app and read the scripture of the day. Have a scripture that maybe you're meditating on that's in your heart each and every day. It will encourage you, it will motivate you and push you forward in the things of God. Amen. Let's jump in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time that we get into your word. I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, show us things to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I, I want to start with this. Uh, when I was in school, middle school specifically, I was in special needs reading. Special needs reading. I would mix my words up. I couldn't stay on the line. Even to this day, if I really want to get something down, I'll take a piece of paper and I'll slide it line by line as I'm reading so that I can understand what I'm, what I'm reading. So I was in special needs reading and I was in special needs English because I could read the words, but I couldn't understand what I was reading because I was reading them word by word. And so maybe you see me today and I'm standing up here reading Bible verses and reading my sermon outline out loud. And that can bring a lot of anxiety to me even today because I know where I've come from. And I think when we talk about reading the Bible, people say that about themselves. Well, I'm not a reader. I'm not good at reading. I've tried reading the Bible and I don't get it. Well, that's because sometimes we're trying to read it on a technical level. We're trying to do words consumption. I want to read through the whole Bible in a year instead of relationship consumption, instead of storyline understanding, and we can get lost in that. So I was never really a reader. I have to work really hard at disciplining myself to read. So right now I'm reading the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. It, anybody ever read it, autobiography of Benjamin Franklin? 
Nobody. Oh, one person. All right. Oh, yeah, I see anybody. Okay. It's actually really good. I, I really enjoy it. I don't read, like, story books or anything like that, fantasy books. Um, I'm more like leadership or uh, self-development or those sort of things. So in this book, you know what it doesn't tell me in the book, Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin? It doesn't tell me, like, his mom's life story. It doesn't tell me his brother's life story. It doesn't talk about any of those other details. Why? What, like, why doesn't tell me everything about Benjamin Franklin's family? Why? That's not the purpose of the book. It literally is the what? Life of Benjamin Franklin. His stories, his life. And when people start to read the Bible or people come into the Christian faith, they're like, the Bible doesn't answer all the questions. Where did dinosaurs come from? How come dinosaurs aren't in the Bible? Where's the cavemen? Where's the aliens in the Bible, if you believe in that? Come on, somebody. Where did all the nationalities and skin colors come from? We don't have that answer. We know where the languages came from, the Tower of Babel when God split language, but we don't have answers to every single question in all of science and all of history. Think about this. In the book of John it says, if if they wrote down every miracle that Jesus performed, just his miracles, I suppose the world could not contain the books that would be written. He did so many. So could you imagine that the Bible tried to write every historical and scientific fact from the beginning of time, from the beginning of eternity to now, how big the Bible would be. And it's this big and many Christians still don't read it. Let's be factual, okay? Okay. Why doesn't the Bible have all those answers? Because that's not the purpose of the Bible. Just like the purpose of the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin is to tell the story of Benjamin Franklin, the Bible is to tell the story of Jesus Christ, his lineage, and how we relate to him. That is the purpose of the Bible, is to point us to a need for a savior, and how we can have a relationship with God. But one topic that people get hung up on is the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Old Testament versus the New Testament. Should I be reading the Old Testament? Do I live by the laws? Am I supposed to live by the Mosaic law? Did Jesus abolish the law? Therefore, are we no longer to have any need for the law, any need for the Old Testament? Should we just avoid reading the Old Testament since it's the old, outdated story? So I want to kind of tackle that question today. Old Testament versus the New Testament. On Wednesday night Bible study, Pastor Josh taught us that the, the separating factor between the Old Testament and the New Testament is Jesus Christ. Everything in the Old Testament was written B.C. Everything in the New Testament was written A.D., Literally, time itself separates the Old Testament from the New Testament. But, and this is kind of like my problem with Old Testament, Old Covenant, and New Covenant, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, although written A.D., or the year of the Lord, are still under the confines of the law. So everything Jesus did and said was still under law. We don't get freedom or the grace from the law until after the cross and the Holy Spirit comes. So it's, it's important to understand when we're reading the Bible what we're looking at. So here's a challenging verse. We've got to look at this in Matthew 5, 17. It says this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law, Jesus is speaking, or the prophets. So the law and the prophets refers to the Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them, but to what? Fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not even a, the least stroke of a pen. And that's important because in that language, it was actually even an art form, right? How their letters were designed, that if you remove the stroke of the pen, it would change the meaning of that word. It would change the meaning of that letter. So could you imagine not crossing a T? What letter do you now have? Either an I or a lowercase l. Right? It changes what the word is. So not even the stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Verse 19. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands 
and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of God. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Woo! You know, he says things like this. The Pharisees, they were clean on the outside, but they were empty on the inside. They, they, they lived by a set of rules and standards, but they didn't really know God. And so what he was saying is their righteousness is as a filthy rags. So there has to be a righteousness that's better than their ways, and that's through Jesus Christ. And so when someone looks at this passage of Matthew, sometimes they focus too much on the fact that Jesus did not come to abolish the law. They say, look, Jesus didn't abolish the law, so we need to live by all of them. And so some of you think there's only 10 commandments, right? 10 laws, but there's actually 613 laws. I said 300 something first service and I was way off. So 613, Pastor Josh had to come correct me, the house theologian. So some focus on that. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, so we have to live by all 300, 613 laws. While some others say, well, they, they, they don't put enough emphasis on the fact that Jesus fulfilled the law. And this is interesting because we have to understand the broader context. Jesus delivers in the, has anybody read the Sermon on the Mount? The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is delivering his kind of clarity of the law, clarity of scripture. And at times in there, he would ratify, modify, or adjust certain laws of Moses. And he would say something like this. You have heard it said, but I say to you. Anybody read something in scripture like that? You have heard it once said, this, but I say to you. Uh, I'll give you an example for one. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, turn the other cheek. Oh, Lord. God gets slapped up in my face, right? Check this out. He said this in Matthew 5.33. Again, you have heard it said... To the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, right, he's bringing correction, he's bringing clarity, he's refining. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is by God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool. Right? So he's bringing clarity, he's adjusting, he's fulfilling what he had said. And if you watched last week's uh, online stream... I, I made this statement. If I sent a text message to you that said, where are you? Come here now. In all capital letters. How's that coming across? Angry. Well, how do you know it's angry? So you have a definition that says if anybody has capital letters, they're angry. So we've attached an emotion to capital letters. Don't use capital letters. Isn't that crazy how we just created a law? We just created a secondary law based upon our own view of things, our own lenses. Come on, somebody. But then I come to you and I say, dude, what's up? You mad at me? You texted me all capital letters. Oh, dude, I just had caps lock stuck on. I didn't mean nothing. I was wondering where you were at. Or, yeah, I wrote in all caps letters. I was concerned, man. You had me scared. So you said anger. But their intention was not anger. The face-to-face -face conversation brought clarity to the text message. The face-to-face -face communication brought clarity to the text message. And that's what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ came to the earth to bring clarity to his text message called the Bible. Right? Amen. Amen. And I want to be transparent with you because we are doing the Wednesday night Bible study and many of us are in Bible school and all those sort of things. Here's what we know. We don't know much. We know we don't know much. And that's why there's so many denominations. There's so many theolog theological standpoints. Because we do our best to discern what scripture says based upon the information that we have. 
Now, if you were raised that God is angry all the time and that God wants to punish you and that God does bad things to teach you a lesson, then when you read the Bible, just like the capital letters, you are looking at Scripture in that way. But if you believe that God is a loving, caring, gracious, merciful God, then you're going to read Scripture in that way. It's the bias, the biases that we bring to Scripture based upon how we were originally taught text. And so Jesus comes in and he brings clarity to that. So let me explain something else. Besides the fact that there were 613 laws that they had to live by in order to fulfill the righteousness, they created what's called secondary laws. There was a group of people called the scribes and the elders. And they created a whole nother set of laws to ensure that you didn't break the first law. Okay? So the law said, do not eat anything that is unclean. So now in their minds, in their interpretation, they said, okay, we got to ensure that we don't eat anything unclean, so let's wash our hands. So no dirt gets in our mouth. So then they created a law that said, before you eat or sit down at the table, you must wash your hands from the tip of your finger to your elbow to ensure that you don't eat anything unclean. Secondary laws. Here's another law. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We know that one? So in order to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, the laws of the scribes and the elders said, you cannot work on Sunday. Well, Saturday then. You cannot work on the holy day. So no work can be done. But that was never the law. So Jesus comes along and he says, if your horse falls in a ditch on the Sabbath, will you not take it out? They literally wanted to kill him because he healed somebody on the Sabbath day. Because he technically worked. So Jesus broke the secondary laws. He never broke the original laws. He never broke the laws of heaven. He never broke the law of God. Right? So he comes and he heals someone and says, wait, that's work? Isn't healing somebody remembering the Lord and keeping him holy? Come on, somebody. And I'm telling you, the church even today gets hung up on secondary laws. We get hung up on tradition and ritual over scripture and identifying what the word means. So... I've been working with Pastor Josh, He's, he has a house, and he, uh, he's like, hey, Pastor Mike, can you come help me remodel my bathroom? His bathroom had linoleum on the floor, uh, the, it had like this old looking wallpaper, the vanity needed some work, it needed a new sink and all that kind of stuff, so we pulled up the linoleum, we pulled out the vanity, ripped up the toilet, put a subfloor down, put mastic down, put tile down. And we begin to renovate the bathroom, refinish the bathroom, restore it to a new and bright and living space. Do you know what we didn't do? We didn't walk into his bathroom like, dude, burn it down. Just light, just light this thing on fire. It's junk. It's all got to go. We got to abolish the bathroom from your house. Right? Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't come in and abolish the law. It's all got to go away. No. What did he do? He came in and refined it. He refined it through grace. He remodeled it. He reclaimed and repurposed things and made them better. The Bible says that today, in light of Christ, in light of grace, we have new and better promises. A new and better covenant through Jesus Christ. As we were working in Pastor Josh's bathroom, we gave careful attention to the things that we could keep, that we didn't have to go buy. Like, honestly, maybe, believe it or not, like baseboard trim, that junk can get expensive, right? So it was still in good shape. So let's cut the caulk off of it and let's pull it off with a crowbar, sand it down a little bit, repaint it. That can go back up. So there was parts of it that we could use, parts of it that we could refinish, and others that just had to go. And that's what Jesus Christ has done for us, New Testament versus the Old Testament. If you get lost in the Old Testament, it, you can easily forget 
that when reading the Old Testament, we must read it in light of the New Testament. Right? But he did not just do away with the law, he fulfilled the law. He fulfills the messianic hope of Israel. They thought that they were getting like this overarching conqueror, that he was going to come riding in on a horse and destroy everybody, and he came as a baby. So he didn't come the way they wanted, but the, he came the way they needed. He came the way they needed. He fulfilled all righteousness, the Bible says. So we may say, you know what, Pastor Mike, I understand what you're saying, but I'm going to be Torah observant. I want to follow the law. Do you really? Do you really? Because if we really wanted to follow the law, 613 of them, we'd have the barbecue grill set up out back. And this week as you sinned, which we've all have done something that has missed the mark and fall short of God's perfection, you'd bring your cats and your dogs, and we cut them in half, and we throw them on the grill, and we burn them up. Huh? I'm just saying, if we're going to follow the law, we got to have sacrifice. Ain't nobody sacrificing nothing. You didn't kill your pet lizard this week. Huh? Okay, another one. Uh, if your child is disobedient and disrespects you, you need to take him out to the streets in front of all your neighbors and stone him to death. Oh, see, see, but that's so easy to say, well, you know, well, that one. You can't pick and choose. Right? To live by the law, you're condemned by the whole law. Come on. It's just hypocrisy to say, well, I live by certain laws, but I'm not. You're a hypocrite. Literally. Come on, somebody. We love the fact that we, inside of us and who we are as a spirit man loves to know that we have been saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law. It is important, put this up on the screen, it is important to understand, however, that it is not so much the law itself that is everlasting, but is his, the person who fulfilled it is everlasting. Jesus Christ being the fulfillment of the law is what is lasting. The importance behind this is this. The law is cold. I know all of our phones are going off. There's a snow squall coming. And now we're all worried. Like, is he going to end on time or are we going to get stuck in the snow? Dear God. Devil is a liar. I got the message before I came up, but I didn't want to have a mass exodus, so I just didn't say anything. <laughs> Listen, the law is given, written on what? What was the law written on? A stone, a tablet of stone. And I don't even know how that dude engraved it so fast, but it was, the law is given on a tablet of stone. Can you have a relationship with a stone? Well, I don't know, in society today, I guess anybody can have a relationship with anything, but... <laughs> no! The stone is hard and cold, it's rigid. But grace came by the person, Jesus Christ, a God that we could have a relationship with. And beyond that, it's the only God in any religion that says he came in human form and was tempted and tested and went through all things like us so that he could identify with us and that we could go to him about any of the issues of our lives. That's the greatest story of the gospel. He fulfilled the law for us that we could have a relationship with him. As new covenant believers and sound interpreters of scripture, we need to be able to discern the teachings of the Old Testament that are still applicable and those that are no longer. Okay? We understand we're not stoning our kids when they didn't make their bed. Right? Dude, I've been dead 10 times. Like, no, like every day. Like, I spanked every day. So, like, straight up, I'd be dead, right? Your boy wouldn't be here right now. Thank God. So, we can understand that one. So, what's the test? How do we know what things of the Old Testament are still applicable at the same level today? Well, if they are re mentioned or reinforced, 
in the New Testament, we can understand that they still stand. What was, what, what was the thing that was like the discerner of that? If it passed through the cross, if it passed through the blood of Jesus and is still in the New Testament, it is applicable to our lives. That's a great test. So if you're ever in the Old Testament or you hear someone saying something that's like overtly crazy religious, like we can do nothing on Sunday or nothing on Saturday, we can't even turn a light switch on, we're like, wait a second, okay, why? Well, because we can't work. Secondary law. That was a secondary law. The law is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And that, that still stands today. There should be in our lives, can I just say it? There should be a Sabbat or a Sabbath in our lives. There should be a day of rest. Now, where can I come up with that? Listen, do you really think that on the seventh day of creation, when God made the earth and light and day and animals, it says on the seventh day he rested, you think it's because God was tired? The scripture says he tires not. He tires not. God didn't rest on the seventh day because he was tired from making creation. Guys, I'm so exhausted. Do you know how much it was to make woman, guys? Hey. <laughs> Woo. They're so intricate and complicated. I don't even understand them, guys. Wore me out. No. God, God rested on the seventh day as an example for us. It was only for us. Say, listen, let your body refresh and rest and watch an entire Netflix series on your day off. Okay, yes, amen. But it was remember the Lord and keep it. Okay. Hebrews 8.13, check this out. In speaking of the new covenant or the new testament, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. We'll see Pastor Mike right there. He made it all obsolete. All right, let me explain this to you. Let me break this down to you. Anybody in here ever got a new, and I can only talk about iPhone, sorry, Android users, I love you, I just don't understand you. <laughs> Sitting on the front row, grieving my spirit, grieving me, bro. All right, so the new iPhone 15 is out, right? And I'm kind of like a tech junkie, I want to get the new iPhone when it comes out. So I get the new one. And, and when you get the new one, you put the old one next to it, and you like scan that really weird like spacey thing, and it says, would you like to transfer all your data, all your pictures? Gosh, we got like 10 years of pictures, right? Yeah, transfer them all. And, but, you know, me, like if I'm going to go through my phone and I'm going to transfer and get a new one, I'm going to go through, delete some videos, and I'm going to delete some apps that I don't use anymore. But 90% of what was on my old phone, I'm transferring to my new phone. And what do I do with my old phone? I go into general, uh, settings, general, erase all content. I reset the phone. Reset it back to factory. And then I pass it down to one of my kids. Right? What I don't do, right, what I don't do is I don't keep using my old phone after I got the new phone. Because my old phone is now obsolete. My old phone's obsolete. I don't use it anymore because I have the new iOS. I got the new operating system. I got the new M2 chip in it. It's faster, all these things, Right? But the content is still like 90% the same. I still transfer my content over, although I no longer use the old device. And that's kind of like it is the idea of the Old Testament and New Testament. There's a lot that was transferred over. There was a lot that's in the new, the new Testament, the new covenant. But how it operated, the operating system behind it, the fear and the laws and all those things, they're kind of obsolete. But what did transfer, what did transfer is under the new covenant, under the new operating system. It runs faster, it runs better, and is beneficial to your life. Amen? Uh, an idea of this is like these, these uh, Jews, they find Christ and now they're, you know, bringing the gospel. And there's this group of people called Gentiles. Gentiles were not covenant people. They had no right to God. And these Gentiles are now hearing the gospel message and they're coming to church and they're saying, man, this is great stuff. How do I get part of this? They said, well, we need to talk about that. So they got a little council together and said, okay, what are we going to make them do so they can join our church? You know what we're going to do? We're going to enforce circumcision. 
You want to come to our church? You got to be circumcised. We are in pain. You're going to be in pain, right? We had to do, and we still have this today, right? Like, there's things that I can't do because I'm a Christian. How come that person, they call themselves a Christian, but they can still do all these things. And we keep enforcing laws based upon our own personal convictions. Mm, come on, somebody. I just, I just, this year, just in my spirit, man, like, the Bible tells you, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. <laughs> work out your own salvation, man. It doesn't matter what someone else is doing. What is God leading you to do? We want to judge somebody else for not living to some standard. Well, they don't go to church every single week. Okay, and you're a gossip. And you overeat. All right. I'm not, I'm not even judging. I'm just saying, like, be careful, the Bible says, with judgment. Because for the same measure that you judge, it shall be measured back. I don't want to be in that boat. I don't want to be in that spot. All right? As Pastor Josh and I were renovating his bathroom, we gave careful attention to retain as many properties as we could. Like toilets, they're expensive, man. Right? So if I could take the toilet out, put the floor down, just put a new wax ring and put that same toilet in, we save a couple hundred bucks. We retained the things we could. We saved the molding. We saved the heat register. Heat registers, oh my gosh, those things are so much money, right? We could paint it, fix it, sand it down, paint it up, put it back in. Same thing is what Jesus Christ, when he came to fulfill the law, he brought clarity and reformation and modification to it, to a livable relationship with him. As we read the Bible, if there's something in the Old Testament that you read that seems out of character to the New Testament God that you know of, See if those things were ratified through the person of Jesus Christ. See if it's in the New Testament. See if it's reinforced. See if Jesus teaches or talks about it later on in the New Testament or Peter or Paul. Remember, the teachings of Jesus were fulfilling law. So there's a lot of things in there that we could really break down and have discussion with, and we will on Wednesday nights if you want to come on out to that. Not everything in the Old Testament still holds weight in the New. Just like we said, we're not killing our kids, we're not killing our dogs, we're not making sacrifices. There's a lot of things that are not fully coming to in the New Testament. Determining which passed the test of the cross is proper Bible study. How do I read my Bible? This is one of those introductory that understands the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Please do not try to live by 613 laws. To live by the law, you're condemned by the whole law, even the ones you don't know. That's a scary thought. That's a scary thought. All right? The whole point of the Bible, the whole point of the Old Testament leading into the New Testament was to point to Jesus Christ. To know him and him crucified. The price that he paid to bring you into a relationship with him. If you're watching online or you're in the room and you've never had that opportunity to start that personal relationship with God. Maybe he's just been a cold book or a, a set of stone words that have been very rigid and very fearful. But you don't know a loving, merciful, caring, gracious God. I would love to introduce you to him today. And the Bible says this, with the heart man believes, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you will, shall be saved. And if you need that today, if you need to take that step of faith in God and invite Jesus into your life, maybe you've prayed a salvation prayer before, but you've never asked Jesus to be part of your life. Maybe that's the step to take today. So if you're watching online or you're in the room, we like to pray this prayer together out loud and it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen, amen, amen. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.